we look at the past, I would hope we can get inspired by looking at the craftsmanship and looking at the details and long to build better because we see beautiful things like this. Now, <laughs> gonna need a flow chart here. The guys who led this thing, okay, are the who's who that influenced building and design here for the next little while. Um, and we're gonna talk about these architects. This is Louis Sullivan, it's Richard Morris Hunt. There's McKean Mead and White, and there's H.H. H. Richardson, okay? Um, if you remember, don't look here, okay? Um, Benjamin Latrobe, he's kind of the European, the first professional architect to come here. He traded a guy named Robert Mills. There was a guy named Thomas Walter who worked under him. Charles Bullfinch had Asher Benjamin who trained at the old town, who teamed up with A.J. Davis. Remember all these people, right? There's this family tree of architects and they're all connected. There's a school in uh, Paris called the École des Beaux-Arts, right? Which is the School of Fine Arts. It is a uh, very famous art school. Uh, there was a uh, art program there and there was an architecture program there. It was thought that the School of Fine Arts in France was the best school for architecture. Now, this is in the 1850s, 1860s. There is no architecture program in America, right? There is no school for architecture. And so Richard Morris Hunt, who grew, kind of grew up kind of a dandy, he, he built the Biltmore, okay? He did the Met, okay, the New York Met. He did the, uh, the base of the Statue of Liberty, the pedestal that she sits on. Very important, 1827, 1895. He is the first American grad of the School of Fine Arts in, in France. Big deal, right? He comes back. The reason he gets uh, clients like the Vanderbilts and stuff like that is because he's the one of the first trained famous guy uh, that does that. When he comes back to his office, he there's a program that the School of Fine Arts did, it's called an atelier, okay? An atelier program means that you copy the past, okay? You draw and you, you copy the past, and then you get in a studio, a group of, of people that together, that you all draw together and you work on these problems together, okay? It is kind of the, the there was the modern way of, of designing and of doing an office. He trains all these young people underneath him, one of which is a guy named William Ware. Now, uh, this is in New York. So he has the atelier in his office and he trains this guy William Ware. Now William Ware goes back to Boston and he starts an office and he has an atelier in his office and the people from MIT came to him and said, we want to do that at school. Will you come start an architecture program at MIT? So he goes, yeah, okay. So he goes to MIT and about 15 years later, Columbia comes along and says, uh, we want to hire you away because we want to start an architecture program. So they hire him away and he works at Columbia for a long time. His program and the methods of his teaching before he started these programs, he went to this School of Fine Arts, he went and traveled around Europe, found out what the best instances were and came back and based the training of American architects on this School of Fine Arts, okay? Now, he then has all these people who are influenced under him. There's another guy, H.H. H. Richardson, which we'll talk about in a sec. He went to the School of Fine Arts. He's the second American to go there. He went there for a year. McKean, Weed, and White, they two of those guys trained under Richardson. McKean went to the School of Fine Arts. You're seeing a pattern here. All these guys are connected, okay? And you'll see that as we go forward here. But all these guys know each other. All these guys are trained the same way, and they go from there. So the AI forms in 19, 1857, who does that? Richard Morris Hunt, okay? He uh, is the one who was organized in the office in New York. He's the one who becomes the grandfather of the AIA uh, and starts that in 19, 1857. First school uh, at MIT, I was wrong, it's 1868, not 1881. Um, he starts that and that's William Ware. Uh, the first builder paper or architect paper is this paper in 1876. And then uh, Columbia starts their program in 1881. Now, what's interesting is that William Ware, when he went to Columbia, couldn't get a strict architecture program because they wanted it tied to the School of Mines, okay? And basically that was an engineering program. And so there's the fight between are we training artists or are we training you know, guys who know how to build? And I think that's a, a conversation that goes on in architecture schools today. And so, you know, 
are we doing great design stuff or are we doing practical building things? And that was a problem for them at Columbia when he was, when he was starting his program. Um, now, the reason they do it, and it was interesting, there's a whole book on the start of Columbia University, and <laughs> the reason they, they, he gets funding on the board, the board, so one guy says, you need to start a program at Columbia. He has to go to the Board of Regents, and they have to approve the program, right? The Board of Regents says, we don't need an architecture program, and they say, well, yeah, we do, because think about the tenements, think about the problems in these buildings, and literally one guy said we're having Irish plumbers plumb these buildings and they don't know what they're doing. Kind of a racist statement. I'm Irish. I kind of take offense at that. Um, and so they were basically saying cheap building. No one knows how to build these tall buildings with the plumbing and everything else so that they work. We've got to have architects because we need them to know how to build. And it wasn't about building something beautiful and designing something beautiful. It was about designing cities that work. And so realize that that was that conflict that was going on there. Um, Richard Morris Hunt, first to graduate there. And then these two guys, both, uh, both attend for a year. And then McKean being a white, two, uh, McKean went to uh, there. Now, um, so, I want to study three of these architects, okay? H.H. H. Richardson, um, McKean Mean and White, and Louis Sullivan, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll get into Frank Lloyd Wright next time um, and study these guys. But remember, we're still talking about the city, and you'll start to see some houses come out of these guys' work, but uh, these guys are kind of the driving force of design and beauty, right, during this time. Uh, 1886, he dies young, he dies at 47. He studied at the school. Um, he, he is greatly, greatly influential uh, on McKean, Mead, and White because McKean and White both worked in Richardson's office for him. Uh, he's thought to be kind of the, the top three architects with Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright as kind of the, the top three guys in America in, in this time as far as design prowess. Um, he does this style of architecture called Romanesque, okay? He dies young, and when after he dies, there's a style Richardson Romanesque, right? Because it's a style based on Richardson's work, and so Richardson Romanesque is a Romanesque style, but because he's the one that kind of drove that, um, that's, that's where it gets famous. Now, Trinity Church in Boston. Uh, anybody seen this building? Great Romanesque building, right? See the medieval elements that are going on here, kind of French and other kind of details there, but very uh, heavy, right? Very thick, 1872. Ironically, we're gonna look at Mahimu White across the street of that is the Boston Public Library. And they studied under Richardson, but built the library across the street. This is the, uh, another library he did, right? Uh, just see how heavy and thick that is, right? I mean, it's just, it is a massive building. It's hard to build a house like this because the scale is hard, right? Because these are massive boulders and massive, massive things there. Yeah. The Texas Capitol is Richardson. We're going to look at a bunch of Texas courthouses. Okay. The Capitol. I don't think the Capitol is. Oh, it's not. I don't think so. Um, it's it's neoclassical. It's uh, I don't think it's Romanesque, but we'll we can talk about it. I'll show you some that are. Um, this is after he dies. This is a Romanesque building. Look at the similarity between these two, right? There's one he did. And see the little tower in the arch? And then there's the little tower in the arch. Again, medieval, right? Looks like a heavy Florence medieval building. Um, but that's part of kind of his style. This is a Marshall Fields. Also looks like a Florence building. But a Medici building or something. 1887 after he died. Very influential. Louis Sullivan, 1856 to 1924, he is part of the Chicago School of Architects. And there's a whole school of architects from Chicago because remember, our Chicago's growing so fast. They've got all these buildings to build, all this design stuff they need to do. He obviously influences Frank Lloyd Wright because Frank Lloyd Wright works for him, okay? And so is moonlighting and ended up getting fired by him because of his moonlighting. Um, he's considered the father of the architect, uh, the skyscraper, and of course, form follows function. Who's heard of that thing, huh? Okay, Louis Sullivan is the one who said that, okay? 
It is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, all things human and all things superhuman, of all the true manifestations of the head, of the heart, and of the soul, that the life is recognizable in the expression that form ever follows function. This is the law. Now, this, this phrase, form follows function, has been screwed up and messed up for a long time because people used it to say there's no ornamentation, okay? There, 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 things should be very strict and there should be no ornamentation, but you'll look at his buildings and you'll see that they're incredibly ornamented. And so he did not think that. This is actually comes from Vitruvius, if we go all the way back to the Georgian period, uh, Vitruvius, who was the only Roman engineer, wrote about firmus, utilitas, and veritas, and which is about uh, what the three qualities of building should have, which it should be useful, it should be you know, well-built, and it should be beautiful, okay? So that's what Louis Sullivan was talking about when he talks about form follows function. Now, if you've ever seen one of his buildings, they're fantastic, okay? I was in Buffalo for a conference, and I got to see their uh, incredible city hall, and then I saw the, the guarantee of the Prudential building, um, and it's a bank building, Adler Sullivan, 1894. I don't know if you're going to be able to see all this detail and everything in here. You can see that. It's, uh, he used terracotta, okay, but he would create these ornamental forms, and they're incredibly beautiful. Um, I sat there and stood and, and kept trying to capture this, picture, this building with my camera, um, but it's overwhelming. If you stand across the street, like if you look at this thing, you really don't see much of that, okay? But when you get close to it, you start looking and going, oh my gosh, this is, this is incredibly well built, incredibly well designed and thought through. Um, this requires a building that uh, terracotta is not a structural material. This is really something that has to hang on a steel frame. So this really couldn't have happened 10 or 15 years earlier. So, right, so all these technologies and all these things are happening right now, and he figures out a way to make the skyscraper the most beautiful thing on the street. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a stunning building if you ever get to go there. Um, it's very special. The, uh, this is the Chicago Trade Arch. This is actually in Chicago. You can see uh, 1893. There's the building. There is the arch. There is the skyscraper. It got torn down, but uh, they saved the arch, and it's now in a park. <clears throat> so Sullivan was probably the true, only true modernist here, and we'll, we'll start talking about modernism, okay, um, as it develops, uh, but really we should point to guys like Sullivan, um, who are doing things that are a little bit different. The White City, okay, had all these East Coast architects come, and a few Chicago architects, uh, Burnham and Root, and then Sullivan and some others. But the, there was a, Richard Morris Hunt did a building, McKean and White did a building, and theirs was very classical Beaux-Arts, okay, which is that French classicism, very ornate. This is what Sullivan did, right? Kind of, uh, uh, it's modern, it's different from this, you know, style and this, this kind of deal. And so he was the one who kind of zigged where the other guys zagged, um, and he ended up getting uh, burned for that because after the panic of 1893, there was a recession, he never really recovers. And so the last part of his career, he lives till 1924, is that he ends up doing these buildings in like Iowa, and this one's in Minnesota. Um, where he practices some of these things, but he never gets the attention and, and acclimate that maybe he should have. And so this one's in Iowa, 1914, right? You can still see him practicing that ornamentation, um, but very interesting, cool buildings. Now, anybody read The Fountainhead? Okay. Fountainhead is basically about these two. Now, it's not word for word, but Anne Rand was known to have been researching Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan. And as I said, Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright worked for Sullivan, okay, and was one of his lead designers, but was also moonlighting, okay? And so in this book, uh, Henry Cameron is the, kind of the, 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 the main guy or the, the older guy, and Howard Roark is the young guy who comes up underneath him. 
Louis Sullivan in real life really did kind of lose his business, lose his way, never had the success and fame that his young protege had. And so if you want to read a book about these two, about these two, that's what the Fountainhead is about. And it's about kind of architecture and the, this guy kind of losing his way and this guy being this rising star and uh, eclipsing the, uh, the, the guy who inspired him and trained him. Kind of interesting. I don't know. <laughs> um, in the book, he blows up the building at the end. Um, the, uh, okay, and then the last group is McKinney and White. Now, these guys are it, okay? Uh, it's, it's questionable whether Frank Lloyd Wright's the most influential architect or what these guys did. Um, it's three partners, um, Charles Fuller McKean, uh, he, was, he was kind of the connections guy. He was the uh, uh, well-heeled, blue blood guy. Uh, Meade was, had studied some architecture, but really, you know, was not the architectural talent. He was the one who ran the office. He was the one who made the business work. And then Stanford White was this creative force. He worked under H.H. H. Richardson for a long time, was H.H. H. Richardson's lead guy. And they, for about 20 years, do everything. I mean, they are, uh, uneclipsed as far as their volume of work and the things that they were able to do in, in a very short period of time. It starts with Madison Square Garden. Uh, this one's obviously been torn down. This is the Harvard Club. And look who I find, okay? There's Diana. She was up on the Madison Square Garden. She was 18 feet tall and weighed 1,800 pounds and on a tiptoe. Um, and he originally had a hair wearing, wearing clothes, but it blew off. She... <laughs> She uh, comes down and uh, they try to redo her. Anyway, she ends up in the Philadelphia Museum like uh, 20 years later. But that's where she started. Uh, and it's Godin, 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 who's this incredible sculptor. Love his stuff. But this is this, this balance and poise that is, that is her on her tiptoes shooting this arrow. Try, try doing that. Try standing and doing that. Look perfectly balanced. It's wonderful the way it's put together. But so McKean, Moon & White, they, they worked with the most talented uh, craftsmen. They, they had the best projects and they just did everything. Um, Columbia University, their whole campus, uh, this is the Lowe Library. Uh, you can see that they get their inspiration in classicism. So this is neoclassical, this is Beaux-Arts, right? Beaux-Arts is that French school. When you see their Beaux-Arts, uh, heavily ornamented, uh, droopy, drapey swags and details like that, that's Beaux-Arts. The uh, New York Public Library is Beaux-Arts. If you've ever been there, it's an incredible Beaux-Arts building. Um, they did the arch in Washington Square. Um, this is the New York Library at New York University. Um, beautiful buildings. Obviously, this, this looks like the Parthenon. Um, but based in classicism, they determine kind of what these cities look like. And the whole city, beautiful movement, is pushed by designs and art like this. And that's why so many things look the way they do. This is Pennsylvania Station. They got tragically torn down. Considered one of the finest buildings they ever did. Uh, the light in there was incredible, and uh, it got torn down to build a very ugly Madison Square Garden. This was their building at the Great White City. It was the agricultural building. Um, I mean, look at that, right? And so the, this, the, the, the way they built that White City was all on plaster, and they painted it white. And so it was, it was basically... Uh, a temporary building and uh, meant to come down and they did that a lot at these at these uh at these world's fairs is they i mean that does not look like it's going to fall down right that, that does not look like it's temporary but they did uh they were built for very short term this is the boston public library built across the street from trinity church um a beautiful building if you look inside Right. And what a tremendous building. Right. And see this kind of the lion in this entry hall. This is science. Right. Gazing at the earth and trying to figure things out. It's just gorgeous, beautiful stuff. Very inspiring. And they just did everything. They worked at the White House. They redid the rotunda at the UVA, which is maybe the most important architecture building in, in America. Great houses, great buildings, they were it. And they, they only ran for 20 years, right? So 1890 to 1910, and then Stanford White gets shot by a jealous lover, like in 1908 or something like that. And then Meade gets shot, or Meade dies, and so there was only one left. Anyway, it was, it was kind of crazy, but for this brief period of time, they were it.